Hey everybody, here we are at uh, another Melillo Method podcast, Everything Brain. We say that because we talk about everything that has to do with the brain at the highest level. And one of the most common topics that is out there that I think is also very misunderstood is ADHD. So I know you have some preparations in here, but we want to really devote talking about what ADHD is really um, and what can be done about it. Well, welcome everyone, and I'm excited to be back. So yeah, I mean, I think for us, it's ADHD is such a, a huge problem in society, and we see so many children being diagnosed with ADHD. We see so many adults that are coming forward and talking about their experience as a young child and saying how it's crippling in their adult life now. So why don't we try to demystify some of the things that people are saying? I mean, there's so much information out there on social media talking about, well, you know, you see these people like, oh, I have ADHD and it allows me to do this. And I have ADHD and it, I'm capable of doing this. But in reality, really what they're talking about is the brain asymmetry that we've been talking about. That in some, most instances, they either have a developing right hemisphere that's developing faster or they have a left hemisphere that's developing faster. So why don't we talk about that today? Sure. Yeah, and I think first, first of all, you know, we both see a lot of podcasts because you send me things, and even on somebody like Joe Rogan, who I think is great, but you know, there was somebody on there who was saying that there's no such thing as ADHD. There's a lot of people out there, supposed experts. You know, they don't really actually know anything about the brain, but you know, clearly, attention has been one of the most, you know, consistently and uh, accurately studied aspects of all neuro of all psychology, meaning going back to the late 70s, I mean, there was this explosion of attention research, and I don't think there's been anything else more studied. So when you talk about understanding the neurology of attention and ADHD, you know, it's out there. It's very, mm -hmm. very clear. Um, and, you know, people have it. People have that. But, you know, a lot of people will say, well, no, it's just another variant. And again, you know, that it's just this. And it's so misunderstood because like you're saying, I mean, there can be a lot of things that can cause attention problems, right? Like if you're anxious, if you're worried about something, you know, if you've been traumatized in some way, I mean, all those things can affect attention. And a lot of people just kind of lump it all together into one thing. And, and, you know, we all see so many kids and so many adults now, they're just throwing that diagnosis, you know, just ADHD, anything. If there's anything difficult, if there's anxiety, if there's depression, if there's any difficulty learning, if there's any behavioral issues, they're just throwing out that diagnosis, ADHD, and then usually just try to prescribe medication of some sort. So, you know, it, it, it's, I think the clear thing we have to understand is separate what's out there and people put and say, okay, this is ADHD, and what is the real neurophysiological model that is out there in the scientific literature and that I've written about extensively uh, that we look at at ADHD. And, you know, one of the things I get is people come in, and whether they're a child or an adult, and they'll say, well, you know, I've been diagnosed with ADHD, or my child's diagnosed, and I'll, I'll say, what type? Is it type one, two, or three? And they look at me like, I don't know what you're talking about, right? So there is a difference and people don't even know that difference and it's not even it's not given to them as a diagnosis and we're going to talk about that it's important because clinically and neurologically type 1 and type 2 may be the exact opposite of one another and so that's where a lot of the confusion because you get two different people personalities two different really symptoms and and you know the way they present and they're the opposite, but yet they both claim to have ADHD. So that's kind of confusing, right? So I think that's where understanding the idea of the right brain and the left brain, and when we talk about the asymmetry, we have to talk about type one, which is the inattentive type, um, you know, where there isn't any hyperactivity or impulsivity, is more typically associated with a left brain delay and overactive right hemisphere in the networks that we're gonna talk about. And the classic ADHD, which is really the type two or the combined type two and three, which is inattentive and impulsive and hyperactive, 
is you know well described as a right brain delay deficit with overactivity in the left hemisphere. So right off the bat, that, there's a huge difference in neurologically complete opposite. Yeah, and anytime I hear somebody on Instagram or any other social media platform, that's what drives me crazy because no one is talking about the nuances of of attention. Okay, the idea that we have attention that comes from the left side of the brain and we have attentional networks that come from the right side of the brain. So you just alluded to the fact that, you know, in a person that has truly an attention and they have lack of focus or detail focus, where is that coming from in the brain? Yeah, so when we look at attention, there's basically five types of attention in the brain that we know of in the human brain. And four out of five of them are predominantly right hemisphere driven. So sustained attention is the main one that we see really impacted. And that's associated with a network called the ventral attention network in the, that is more lateralized to the right side of the brain. Um, and that is, again, a little bit of a broader type of attention, but it's sustained. So it's the type of thing, if we talk about evolutionary hunter-gatherer, you're out there as a hunter and you're looking at you know, the forest, or you're looking for an animal, and you may have to stay there for hours and hours and hours before you see something that, you know, it's very boring, and it may be, you know, and you, and you can't just zone out. You have to have some level of attention, but it's not like hyper-focused attention uh, because that's very energy-driven, right? So it's that kind of attention also divided attention, meaning where you can kind of pay attention to a couple of things at the same time, or so you have a little bit of a wider perspective. And that's the kind of attention you need really in a classroom, right? Like being able to sit there, a teacher talking about something boring, you know, all these things going on around you that you need to be able to filter out, right? But not hyper intense focus. And when we talked about the interactive metronome a couple of um, podcasts ago, the idea of being able to use something like that device to build sustained attention. Because here you are having this very modane task Uh of, okay, I gotta hear this reference tone, I gotta clap to this reference tone, I gotta try to time the reference tone, so the idea that I can maybe be using sustained attention and divided attention Mm -hmm. together. Yes, and then when we look at the left hemisphere, which is much more detail-oriented in general and you know, much more about learning and memorizing things. And when we're really focused, um, like the central executive network, really doing, you know, kind of high level executive functions. Um, The only type of attention that really is purely left brain is really that hyper-focused, detailed attention. That it tends to be kind of short term because again, it's very energy dependent, meaning that if we're really focused on cramming to study or, you know, really reading something to try to extract information from it or memorize something or somebody gives you a phone number and you need to memorize it, you know, you need to really hyper-focus. So we're talking about details and facts. Right. So, you know, really kind of memorizing and learning and, you know, uh, paying attention to facts and details and sequences of things like numbers or words or whatever. Subconscious learning. Yeah, and it's, and the left brain is what we call reward reinforced, meaning that, you know, we're doing it for a reason. Like there's a goal and the the left brain is goal directed. So there's a goal. Why are we paying attention? Why are we looking at something? Why are we doing this? You know, I have a test coming up. and, And so it's like, okay, then when you do it, And let's say you say, okay, now I got it, I learn it. Now there's a reward, which is basically a shot of dopamine. I was going to say, the goal-directed behavior is the dopaminergic pathways. Yeah, Yeah, that says, okay, you know, great, you did it. Um, The problem with video games is that it's designed to kind of hack that system because we get kids with, let's say, a traditional right brain deficit, hyperactive impulsivity, right brain deficient, um, ADHD, the type two or three, and you know, parents will say, yeah, but they can pay attention to video games for hours. They can't do anything. They're constantly moving and running around. And but when it comes to a video game, they can sit still. They can do it, and that's because video games are literally designed to hack into that what should be short-term, hyper-intense, focused AD, you know, attention. 
But because it's re- reward reinforced and because it's short term, what happens is that with video games, they've designed it that way. That you you know you pay attention really intensely for a short term to something that you enjoy that's fun. And then, you know, you kill something or blow something up and you get rewarded. You you get points or whatever, you get rewarded. And then you get, again, so now you can link that together for hours. But that's not the way it's supposed to happen. And you're constantly getting reinforced because you're constantly getting these shots of dopamine. And that actually just makes it worse because it builds up that left brain it drives down the right brain. So now we know that, you know, after a period of time, their attention is even worse. I mean, their sustained attention or divided attention is, is horrible after that, right? Yeah, and, and one of the early, I think, writers that you spoke about many years ago was Fred Privick. And Fred Privick being one of the dominant people in the dopaminergic world that wrote about the reinforcement of these dopaminergic pathways and even when we look at the medications and the class of medications that are often used in the ADH world, they're there to support the more dopaminergic component of this. Yeah, which is almost paradoxical because we know that dopamine is more associated with the left hemisphere. So it's more associated with executive functions, learning, memorizing, motor activity, right? So we know that you know left hemisphere is more about initiating motor activity, and being more more motor driven, dopamine is more about that. We know that it's more about, as we said, learning facts and details and being really hyper-focused on details, um, goal-directed, motivated, motivational, um, all of that. And then being reward reinforced for when you hit a goal um, so that it reinforces that behavior so that we keep on doing that, so that we form that as a habit more easily. So we know that that left hemisphere is is driven that way, but we know that in ADHD, traditional ADHD, typical, the right brain deficit, that dopamine, that left brain dopamine system is overactive. So we're taking medication, which is something like Ritalin, which is designed to increase dopamine, but yet we already have an increased dopamine on the left, but we may have, you know, something affecting those pathways in an area called the basal ganglia, so there's really more of an imbalance in those dopamine pathways, and that's the thing. It's not just it's not a deficiency of that, um, but there's an imbalance that really involves that area called the basal ganglia, and that is really associated with those types of symptoms. So when you're talking about the basal ganglia, you're really talking about the imbalance that exists between the two primary pathways. For most of neurology, was classically taught as the direct pathway driving a more activation to the higher centers of the brain than the indirect pathway being even more like almost like a modulator um, aspect of it. So you're, you're saying that in ADHD that we get overactivation of these direct pathways with inhibition or lack of inhibition coming from the indirect pathway. Right. So in the classic ADHD model, we know that there's this area of the brain called the basal ganglia. It's a collection of different nuclei, and not to get too technical, but it really is kind of the foundation of all human behavior. And really, it can be kind of divided into we either it either initiates certain behaviors and actions and movements and thoughts, or the other part of it will inhibit it, right? So there's this kind of filtering system that we have ideas or things that are in our head and it gets filtered to this thing called the basal ganglia, which then kind of makes a decision, should I let this happen or ramp it up and activate it and let this go? Or do I, you know, second guess myself and say, no, I'm gonna stop it, I'm gonna inhibit it so that I'm not gonna do that. And we see that this balance between these two pathways, the direct is the one that says, okay, do it, go do it. And the indirect is the one that says, no, don't do that. When we have overactivity of that direct, we get what we call hyperkinetic behavior. So this is things like hyperactivity, physical, you know, physical hyperactivity. We may get tics or stimming or unwanted movements, or we may get vocal tics, or we may get mania, right? And then the other thing, the indirect pathway, which is what balances that, if that is deficient, then, you know, or the, if that's too high, then we get more what we call hypokinetic 
which is where there's more slowness of movement, slowness of processing, you know, less maybe depression. And this is more what we see in like a Parkinson's type of model, right? And that's really what we see in that classic. Um, but what most people don't know in even if they do know that basal ganglia, which most people don't, right? Like if we went to the typical neurologist or psychiatrist or psychologist and we said, well, what actually happens in the brain with ADHD, with, you know, more of the classic type 2 and type 3, um, what's happening in the brain? They would really have no idea. They would say something about the frontal lobe. They'd say something about dopamine, but they really have no idea. Um, and, and you wrote two major papers on the basal ganglia, your, your research partner, about you know 15 years ago. That has become some of the most cited papers in the world on the basal ganglia. Yeah, yeah, no, and I wrote about it extensively in the textbook, first of all, and then we wrote about it, and then we wrote even fairly recently some of the most popular basal ganglia papers that are really some of the most referenced papers, and then we wrote about it in that ADHD paper, right? And uh, so, you know, went into that in great detail. So I know it really well. So going back to the direct and indirect, classically it's almost been described as a go and no-go yes. purpose. Right. Yeah, so, you know, there are things that uh, whatever is happening, something in our environment or whatever, we have the idea, well, I should act, I should do something. I should look at it with my eyes and pay attention to it. Um, and then there's there may be something else that says, no, you know, that's not important right now. You know, stay focusing on what you are focusing and, you know, that's not what you need to do right now. And so we need to be able to balance that. Or there's a time when we, we don't want to move, when we don't want to act. So that balance is there at all times, you know, to control our behavior. Um, and if there's a, a problem with that, it's, if it's balanced one way or the other, we may be overactive, again, be hyperactive or have unwanted movements or ticks or, you know, unwanted habits, or we may not be able to initiate one or the other when we should be able to initiate. So it's really having flexibility and in, in those networks that react to what's happening around us. And we have override systems that are there too. So, you know, when I first started, even in my textbook, writing about this, it still wasn't clear to me. Like I knew that there was some imbalance in these dopamine systems because the direct pathway uses a dopamine one receptor, so it's dopaminergic, and the type in the, the indirect uses a dopamine two. But they're not the only neurotransmitters. They kind of initiate part of it, but what really initiates it is something called glutamate. And then there's also substance P, and then there's also enkephalin. So there's mm -hmm. other neurotransmitters in the system. That's why people just think, oh, it's a dopamine thing or whatever. It's never that simple, right? It's never just one neurotransmitter. But the thing that threw me off is on both sides of the system is dopamine and enkephalins and, and glutamate and GABA, the main inhibitory. So, you know, even if you had an imbalance or a deficit of one neurotransmitter it would affect both sides of the system equally. So there's an imbalance in that system, but where is it coming from? How, how does that system get unbalanced? Now you could have a genetic mutation or you could have an injury or you could have some sort of toxic problem or you could have a stroke that might affect one part of the system and not the other, but that's very rare and also pretty obvious that you can see it. But in most people that have anything that affects that system, um, there isn't any obvious genetic mutation or brain injury or anything like that. So the idea of a chemical imbalance causing ADHD or tics doesn't make sense, really, from a neurological perspective. Yeah, and Richard Davidson said that you know, almost 20 years ago. That yeah. You could not explain ADHD in the construct of just a wide discretionary imbalance in neurotransmitters. Right, and so therefore just therapeutically trying to affect one neurotransmitter system doesn't make sense either. And that's why, you know, there's this imbalance. And that's why, you know, let's say Ritalin actually increases the availability of dopamine or changes the receptor sensitivity. And you have it on both sides and both sides of the brain. So you have it on both sides of the of this pathways. And what we see is that if you give someone too much Ritalin or too much stimulant medication, it creates ticks. 
I mean, it creates Tourette's, it creates tics. So meaning that we're giving them dopamine to lower their hyperactivity and maybe, you know, their tics or the same pathways that are involved with tics. But yet if we give them too much, we actually create the thing we're trying to stop. What does that tell you? It means that that isn't really specifically addressing the core problem. It's biasing the system up or down, but it's not really directly targeting the actual, you know, cause and or the solution. All right. So in 2023, you write a new paper on ADHD. It's entitled Front and Center and Maturational Dysregulation of the Frontal Lobe Functional Neuroanatomical Connections in ADHD. In that paper, you really hypothesize the new pathway that you discovered in 2000, early 2000s when it came out. Um, actually, the authors of the pa- other papers discovered it, but then you were like, it was that aha moment for you to say, okay, hey, this is the pathway that I've been waiting for that explains how this functional imbalance. And this pathway was called the hyperdirect pathway. Correct. Yeah, that was a big aha moment because, again, even as I wrote the textbook, I was like, okay, I'm not really, I know that the imbalance of these two systems is what is at the root cause of, of ADHD but I don't see where it becomes unbalanced, right? Because it, it can't be a chemical imbalance and you know most of them don't have damage and it has to be something developmental. And then I read this paper on the hyper-direct pathway that had been discovered. And the hyper-direct way, pa- direct pathway is a separate pathway that only is found in the right brain. So I knew at the time that there had to be a right brain deficit because from the very beginning, it was very clear to me that the symptoms, this unevenness of skills that was being talked about, uh, which is, you know, by the way, something that we'll talk more about because, you know, that's where we have people out there talking about how they have these superpowers or this unusual skill. And it's true. But the only thing is because there's different models, they have different skills, but that there's unevenness and that the left brain things that the left brain do were always kind of overactive or were really good in people with ADHD and these right brain skills were typically poor. And, and again, in the literature, there was so much on attention and how attention was really associated with the right brain and especially the right parietal lobe and the right frontal lobe. And these attention networks were pre- pretty clearly defined. Um, but I wasn't seeing, okay, where does this imbalance come from? And then the hyperdirect pathway was a separate pathway that was only found in the right hemisphere in two areas. One area called the premotor area of the right brain uh, or Broadman area six, essentially, or what was uh, called the supplemental motor area. And that that was for the motor component of it. So the hyperactive physical motor component or if there were ticks or anything like that. And then there was an area in the front called the inferior frontal gyrus that was Broadman area 47, 45, 44, that was really about the more mental, emotional part of it. So like possibly the anger or the anxiety or the obsessive thoughts or compulsive type of behaviors that was also often seen. Because remember, when, when in the beginning of this, the one thing that was really clear was there's a lot of what's called comorbidity, meaning that you almost never saw ADHD without some level of OCD or maybe some level of tics or Tourette's. And they, they came together a lot along with certain types of possibly learning disabilities. Or so, even behavioral. I mean, a lot of oppositional behavioral yeah, right? aspects, a yeah. lot of emotional dysregulation. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to say that there's multiple parts of the brain being impacted, not just attention, it's not just physical hyperactivity, but there's other things. So there had to be an overlap. So those two areas were areas that people talking about in the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe areas. These two parts came together to form what's called the indirect pathway or the hyperdirect that only activated the indirect pathway. So the pathway that inhibits things. So that would mean that if that area wasn't online or if it wasn't developed or if it was immature, that just by the nature of it, the, there would be less inhibition 
or less, you know, stopping things in the system and to be more of the direct pathway, the things that were the pathway that activates all those things. And right there, that explained the model and it was the answer. Um, and so that was a really big aha moment because it also tells you what you need to do. Sure. What you need to do is you need to activate for the physical component, that supplemental motor area on the right, you need to activate that and turn it on and then you need to, for things like maybe OCD or emotional outbursts or anger outbursts or oppositional behavior or, you know, a compulsive behavior, you need to activate the right frontal. And if you have both, then you need to do both in a directed way. But then there's the idea of, you know, how does it get that way? And that's the whole bottom-up component that we talk about. But it really gave you the answer of, okay, this is what this is what our goal is. We need to turn this on and we need to diminish those because overactivity of those same areas on the left is causing over motor so hyperactivity constantly physically moving or ticks and on the frontal portion was causing obsessive or compulsive or over anger or you know hyper focused so you know we we saw that you know this is what's happening and this is what you need to do and to be clear, we're talking about the fact that the hyperdelect pathway is not only firing down to the right basal ganglia, but it's also firing across to in, have an inhibitory effect on the left basal ganglia. Yeah, indirectly. I mean, it, it's actually coming down. It's only found on the right side, and it affects the right. But what's happening on the right then is transferred because there is some communication between those two areas. Okay. Yeah. And then from there, one of the other things we can really say is that when we look at that supplementary motor area and looking at the way patients or or kids or adults will present with their various ticks or their various stims that we're really talking about where in that supplementary pathway is being overactivated okay right. are we o overactivating an area that's associated with the mouth the lips okay mm -hmm. you know we might see with lip smacking or something like that or you know is the area of that represents the fingers being more fired and now we're getting more hand type of movements and we're you know, especially in the autism population where we see a lot of these kids want to have an item in their hand and they're twirling it around and stuff right yeah so in the basal ganglia the classic model by, developed by a guy named Alexander in his lab, is that there were five primary pathways that go come from the prefrontal or from the brain down to the basal ganglia. And the combination of those things at any given moment is what's giving us any sort of behavior. And one of those pathways uh, comes from the supplemental or premotor area, and that controls motor activity. And again, there is this balance where the left side kind of initiates it and the right side inhibits it or stops it, right? We have to start something and then we need to stop it. If we can't stop it, then we keep on doing it over and over and over and over. And that's basically what a tick is, or that's what hyperactivity is. The left brain's initiating it and the right brain's not there to stop it. So that's that direct pathways on, that indirect hyperdirect is not there to stop it. Then there's the frontal eye field. So we know that a lot of the diagnosis of ADHD, there was a point where they would say, you know, if you can't, if they can't fixate their eyes, or if you're trying to look in the eye and you can't look in the eye because their eyes are constantly moving, or they really don't have good eye contact, it, that's a diagnosis or that's associated with ADHD. So there's a thing called the frontal eye field, Broadman area eight, that directs your eyes in a specific direction. And if you can't inhibit eye movements, right? So if you're activating eye movements all over the place, that's the left brain doing that. The right brain would inhibit those eye movements and let you focus it in one way or the other, which is really associated with attention, right? Because when I'm focused on something, I'm directing my eyes towards it and my attention towards it. Then there's uh, what the control of executive function. So a lot of the diagnosis of ADHD is disexecutive syndrome, meaning that, you know, they can't plan or, or, you know, they can't organize things or, you know, different problems with memory or learning or whatever. And we know that, again, that is the left side is really where we're going to be doing a lot of high-level executive cognitive skills. So we know these kids are exceptionally bright. 
They may have phenomenal memory for details. They may read early. They may be able to, you know, learn things, um, do mathematic calculations or read. Um, but the problem is the right brain is really what is mostly controlling a lot of attention. So if you can't pay attention because this is decreased, then even though you are really bright and you can do things, you can't sustain the attention for any length of time, so it's hard to learn. So they may look like they have a learning disability or they may not learn as much. But, you know, a lot of the executive, again, the OCD things or the emotional dysregulation or the oppositional behavior really comes from that overactive executive function and the inability to, you know, inhibit that. Then there's the social behavior um, to be able to act appropriately. Now, most people with that classic true right brain ADHD, you know, they have social issues. They're, you know, a, a slightly less version of the autism spectrum where they're not reading social cues appropriately. That's partly why they're doing things. They're hyperactive. They're running around. They're doing things. They might be, you know, really upsetting or distracting or really even annoying people around them or disrupting the class, and they don't really see it. They don't read the, the social cues of what they're doing, or they don't feel embarrassment or shame or guilt to that same level, right? Or they, And they're just not reading other people as well. And that is that social imbalance that comes from the orbital frontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And we know that a lot of that real oppositional behavior or overly aggressive behavior or, you know, that classic hyperactive impulsivity is really that overactive of that left brain. Um, and then we have the what's called the anterior cingulate, which really is about more motivation. You know, and again, the left brain increases motivation so that we have a motivation to do things. And if you know the classic model of a kid with ADHD, they, they look like the ultimate motivated person. I mean, they're constantly moving, looking for something, and they're doing what's called seeking behavior. They look like, you know, they, ne they have in tremendous amounts of energy. And again, the right side of that anterior cingulate should dampen motivation because too much motivation is what we call mania. And kids with ADHD typically look manic. Too little motivation is what we see with depression. So if we have the overactive right. So, so those five pathways that involve the uh, premotor supplemental motor for movement, the uh, executive pathway, which is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the frontal eye fields, the orbital frontal and the anterior cingulate. Those are the classic five models. And that's been expanded out to about you know, five or six in each one, so there's about 28. Now, each one of those has sub-loops and, you know, sub-pathways so that, as you were saying, you can have all different types of tics that may involve individual parts of the body or the overbody, and, and there's probably hundreds or thousands of sub-loops so that they can look very different, but the underlying problem is really the same. Yeah, so for anybody out there saying that ADHD is not real, they're blowing back on 40 years, if not 50 years of neuroscience. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, anybody that's out there that that is a so-called professional whatever, I don't care what their degree is, if they say that ADHD isn't real, the first thing I would tell an audience is in your mind, think this person has no idea what they're talking about because they don't know it, right? And that's the thing. We're talking about it in a very fluent way. And you know that I've devoted my life to really understanding you know, how the brain works from a functional, anatomical neuroscience standpoint. And because for me, it always made sense. And for me as a parent, when someone tells me my son's ADHD, my first question is, well, what does that mean? I mean, what is actually happening in my kid's brain, you know? And if I go to somebody and say, hey, tell me what's happening in my kid's brain. You just gave me a diagnosis. Tell me what it is. And if they look at me and say, well, I don't know, I'm going to then say, well, then how am I going to listen to anything? Then how are you going to tell me what treatment should be right? Or how are you going to tell me if, you know, this treatment would work or wouldn't work or if there's anything I could do? Because you don't know what it is. And that's it. And most of the people out there, patients who come in to see us, one of the first questions I ask them, has anybody ever tried to describe what's happening in your child's brain that is actually at the root cause or your own brain? And they look at me and they no, no idea. I mean, this week alone in my office, we have people from two patients from Australia, two from Indonesia, from Jakarta, uh, 
We have Brazil, we have Milano, we have uh, Mexico, we have Washington State, California. I mean, that's just a few. People fly in from all over the world, Dubai. And, you know, this is a typical week in my office. And they've been everywhere and they've gone everywhere. And that's, you know, that's where, where they're doing that. And the first question I ask is, has anybody tried to describe to you? You've gone to these so-called, and they, they all say the same thing. Nope, nobody sent anything. And so that's the whole thing. There's a reality to this. There is, attention is probably the most studied thing in all of psychology. You know, a uh, few weeks ago, myself and, and my research partner, Jerry Leisman, we spoke at the Association for Psychological Sciences in San Francisco. It's the conference every year that is the science part of psychology, right? Because most psychologists don't really know the science. You know, they're practitioners and they're good at what they do, but they, they don't really know the science under psychology. And we were asked to speak there about, you know, talking about the things that we do. This was actually the neuroscience of imagination. But the bottom line is that, you know, there's a science under psychology and psychiatry and attention is at the top. I mean, there's more known about it than just about anything, except for maybe how the hemispheres work, right? Sure. Um, and so for somebody to say that there's no such thing as ADHD, it's just, it's an idiotic statement. And it just tells me right off the bat that they don't know what they're talking about. And they're, make, they're putting an opinion out there. So that's the first thing. And it and also tells we were... you there's a lot of misconceptions of what ADHD is and what they mean when they say that. Exactly. And I remember when we went to Boston for the first time and we met with... And Teicher in his lab in Boston, and we were able to have that dialogue for three hours because we're talking on the same wavelength. We're talking sure. about neuroanatomical pathways. They're talking about what they're seeing on their imaging studies of their of the brain of their population of ADHD. They had that neuroquant technology that they were showing us. Right. They also had that other technology that they had that was trying to come up with a biomarker to differentiate between ADHD and tics and Tourette's by just looking at body movement. Right. Okay. Yeah. So here we are at the the number one psychiatric hospital in the in the country right. and having this dialogue and that's what allowed them to become interested in your work because they said, okay, here's a guy who understands the neurophysiology and neurobiology of, of ADHD. So yeah, I mean, I think it is very frustrating when there are so-called experts out there that are in in some ways, I think saying, oh, well, ADHD is, is being overdiagnosed and it's being overdiagnosed to just sell prescription medications. Um, but in reality, it's actually happening. It's happening to all these families that we serve every day in our offices. And we see not only the inattentional problems, but all the other downstream issues that go, like we talked about, the oppositional defiance, the emotional dysregulation, all the, the physiological aspects that we see, the immu immunological imbalances, the gastrointestinal issues that we see, the food sensitivity components of this. And so, yeah, I think that no one is putting it together the way you've put it together over 30 years to say, hey, all these symptoms are real, but there's a neurobiological mechanism that can explain all these symptoms. And mainly that's important because we can then do something to change it. And that was the thing at Harvard when we were there at that lab which, as you said, is, you know, they've been around for 30 years. They're one of the leading labs in the world studying ADHD and developmental biopsychiatry, um, that they completely agreed with our model because they had actually published some of those papers. And, you know, there was no discussion where they were like, well, there's no such thing as ADHD. Of course there is ADHD. Of course. We've studied it. It's there. But what they said to us was we've never seen someone that came up with how to change it because we've been doing this for 30 years looking for a solution and medication helps the symptoms but it doesn't address the core problem so it really doesn't work long term and we've been searching for that answer and we've come up with ways of diagnosing it better and again documenting that it really is there and we can document it as well as anybody um, and especially when there's the inattention and the physical hyperactivity component but We've never seen anybody that came up with a way of saying, okay, yes, this is the system and this is how we change that system by stimulating specific areas of the brain, by inhibiting other areas, by looking at how it got that way to begin with, what, what interfered with development. So again, in that paper, one of the first things it says that I wrote is that it's about maturation. The problem is that there's no injury, there's no damage, there's no genetic mutation, there's no problem with 
a chemical system or with or with receptors. There's no damage. It's a developmental imbalance that has to do with immaturity on one part of the system and maybe over maturity on the other side. And that imbalance is the developmental thing that causes it. And that's why you can't just deal with the brain. You have to look at the foundation. So the foundation of the brain is never is not really built properly and built a little unbalanced like the leaning tower of Pisa, right? And unless we deal with that root core problem, which is really more about movement and, and again, these things called retained primitive reflexes, you're not going to be able to deal with that, that problem, you know, at the penthouse, which is really the, the brain. Yeah, and what you're describing there is the interrelationship between the lower part of the brain being the cerebellum and its relationship to the brainstem, where we know all the primitive reflexes live. And so two of the primary areas that we're constantly seeing is underdeveloped vestibular systems in these children and underdeveloped motor systems in terms of muscle tone. Mm -hmm. And those areas are the muscles that don't have the, tona the tonicity to fire constantly that nonspecific pathway that we spoke about last time into the cerebellum, then the cerebellum firing into these brainstem vestibular mechanisms that are coming in that really drive the maturation of these more higher centers of the brain, the frontal lobe specifically. Sure. And when we go back, even into like the late 90s, early 2000s, the one thing that everybody kind of agreed on uh, with a paper that came out by a guy named Castellanos was that absolutely for sure there's something underdeveloped in the cerebellum that is connected to ADHD. I mean, that was like really clear. That was one of the first clear neuroanatomical markers that was like, okay. So, but again, how do, how do you explain that? And since the cerebellum is on the bottom of the brain, you have to deal with that. But I think a lot of this is, you know, where we talk about the classic right brain. But I think where the confusion comes in is that we talked about there is this type one where there's some inattention without that hyperactivity or without really the tick. They may be energetic and they may be and they may move a lot, but it's not really the classic ADHD model. And neurologically, it's the exact opposite. It's where there's a delay in the left brain. But in also the confusion out there, because especially with the neurodiverse movement and everything, um, people want to highlight their gifts. They want to highlight. And that's good because we were one of the first people to talk about that. There's this unevenness of skills and this deficit on one side really starts because there's an unusual gift on the other. So when one side of the brain is unusually gifted, it may be more likely to cause a deficit or a delay in development of the other side if it comes online too early or too aggressively or hangs on too long or whatever. And so what you see is that there's a lot of people out there that say, well, I'm ADHD and I'm incredibly creative and I'm artistic and maybe great in music. And they're really describing this person that has really strong right brain skills and really more a model that might fit something more like dyslexia, like we've talked about, like you struggled mm -hmm. with. But that person is, you know, very energetic. Usually they're social, so they're very friendly. They want, you know, they want to engage people and they want to talk about it. Um, they, you know, are physical because their body, you know, spatial, visual, spatial. They like moving their body. They're good. They're usually good in sports or dance and they're a physical type of person. So they just naturally want to move their body. Um, they like being outside. They like nature. They look for novelty. They look for, you know, new things. They get bored easily with things that are, you know, really uh, wrote over and over. And also, they may not really understand what's happening in the traditional learning style in a classroom. They may have trouble with reading. They may have trouble with math. They have trouble with memorizing numbers and letters and holding on to those things. And they may forget things way too easily. And they have a broad spectrum. So you could actually say they're actually paying attention to everything all at once. So that their attention is really good, their sustained attention, but it's, it's looking at everything. But they can't do that hyper-focused attention. 
and they don't understand what's going on and they look around and they're looking for clues because they're also socially afraid of being embarrassed. They don't want to look dumb. You know, they're, they're looking around. What do I do? What do I do? I don't know what I do. I can't follow these directions. And that look that looks like ADHD or it looks like they have an attention problem, but it's really very different and those people have those right brain skills and they may be the classic artist or athlete or, you know, very social person or a person that might become a CEO and, you know, has really good interpersonal skills but also struggles with anxiety. But, you know, they so people say, well, I'm ADHD and I'm that. But then you get the other person that is more the classic ADHD, which is this person that's linear and logical and really good in math and really good in science and really bright in academics and very detail-oriented and can have that hyper-focus, too much of that hyper-focus, doesn't have the sustained overactive motor pathways, maybe has a tendency towards tics or had a history of that or obsessive compulsive behavior, which is really more that overactive left and they're really completely opposite but yet both people may go out there and say well I have ADHD and I'm really gifted in certain things and they're both right to a certain extent yeah. right but one is a type one and is a left brain delay the other one is a type two or type three and is a right brain delay and the treatment to be able to modulate both and help both is completely different and opposite so that's why it's important to understand this yeah, because I remember my own childhood, and my mom was being told that I had ADHD. But she's like, but he can't read. Right, yeah, exactly. He, he has a hard time phonetically sounding out words. Right. Learning sight words. Mm -hmm. Difficulty with basic math. Right. But no, Mr. Skyer, he has ADHD. Yeah. And she's like, no, he's in a de it's that this struggle with these that he wants to learn, but he can't learn. And yet he can go out and he can play baseball. He is real social, wants to be liked by all other, all the kids, and you know very you know sensitive you know emotionally and everything. So yeah, those really dominant right brain strengths that I had early on that were very clear. Um, but it, it no one picked up on the fact that I had this learning disability. It, was, it took many years for my mom to meet the, the right therapist that was able to go, no, okay, this kid really has dyslexia or really has, you know, uh, auditory processing problem. Yeah, and I think that's important for people out there if they're listening to this and they want to analyze themselves and they've been told or they thought I have ADHD and they may even describe themselves that way. Understand there's two different type models really classically. And so you need to be more specific about looking at your ADHD and someone that has like the type 1 ADHD, which is inattention, but not really hyper and impulsive, doesn't mean they don't, they're not physical people, that is more of a left brain deficit. And that's more associated with things like a classic learning disability or dyslexia. And again, defined, we'll define dyslexia. Dyslexia is not reversing or transposing letters or words or numbers, that's what people think. No, it means you're having a problem with word reading, with phonics, with decoding, that you're reading maybe a grade and a half to two grade levels below in basic word reading. If you're a really slow reader and it's hard and you're really poor at spelling and you, you, know, you, you kind of have trouble memorizing details, you're probably dyslexic. And schools never use that term but you're probably dyslexic, but that kid is probably more likely to get an ADHD diagnosis than being told, no, this child has a reading problem or they have a learning disability or it may be called a processing disorder. And again, that's even a misnomer because it's really a processing imbalance because we know in classic dyslexia research, people that are dyslexic, they're gifted in their visual spatial skills. Yep. They have, they're gifted in global you know, auditory and visual processing, but they have a problem with detail local processing. So that's where, you know, the understanding this, if you want to change the system and you want to improve it. And so, you know, one attitude is, well, I have these gifts. Let me just focus on my gifts. I'm going to ignore my weakness and just accept me as I am, which is all well and good. But if you can, wouldn't you want to change it and maybe take away any of your weaknesses and 
have everything as a strength and not just have, you know, one really great strength and then one other really great weakness and actually create balance so that everything is working good. That would be a better solution to me, I think, than just purely acceptance, which to me means that you're, you you know, you're just going to not really deal with the problem. Yeah. And I think one of the main issues with that model of saying, okay, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to accept my gifts. Maybe in an adult, that might be okay to a certain extent, but what about this young child or that that asymmetry can get wider and wider and wider, so by the time they do get to adulthood, we're not just talking about a learning disability anymore. We're not talking about dyslexia. We are probably talking about depression. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. We are talking about potentially suicide. Correct. Okay? and. I'm in New York, and the first thing that happens to me this week while I'm in New York yesterday was I turned down 35th Street, West 35th, and there's a body laying in the floor, in the ground, like someone decided to jump off a building, okay? So what drove that person to do that, okay? So I think that that's the biggest thing that we got to realize is the fact that these asymmetries that we're seeing in childhood, if they're not addressed, they are going to manifest into a greater neuropsychiatric event in adulthood. Right. And over the years in, that we've been practicing and working together is that how many more adults are we working with than we've ever worked with? Mm -hmm. Because now so many adults are coming to us and saying, okay, I need you to address this, that I didn't properly address this when I was a younger child and there wasn't this type of therapy before me, but now I understand this and I understand that these symptoms and because I even know for myself how I have to address my own left hemisphere as an adult and then if I don't address it at times my dominant right brain can really take over and and create some mania for me and create some depression for me at times and and everything so right and that's that's a really good point because you know some people may look at it and say okay well why don't we just focus on the child's strengths and ignore their weakness which is actually the model in behavior and education and so what? What's the problem with that, right? So this way we don't make the child feel bad or we, you know, we just boost up their, their gifts. And, and I understand that. From a human standpoint, compassionately, that makes sense. From a neurological perspective, it doesn't because the nature of it, if you're looking at an imbalance in the system, the more you focus on one side and build up the strength, the more you'll create a more, more severe weakness. And the combination of both of those produces symptoms. Too much activity or overactivity of certain networks on one side combined with a deficiency on the other is what all of these mental health and behavioral issues are. And to, you know, we all have a little bit of an imbalance, but when there's too much of it, that's when it produces. And as you said, you know, ADHD might be more of a mild version of that. Uh, if you look at the right brain dominant or left brain or the type 1 ADHD, that might be dyslexic, that might have a learning disability, that might have over, you know, a little bit too much anxiety or too much sadness or too much guilt and shame. I mean, if you look at the definition of major depressive order disorder, it's, you know, too much sadness, not enough joy, which is generated by the left brain, and guilt and shame. That is the definition of major depressive disorder. So you get that, and if you get that to an extreme version, that's really bipolar. And we know that, as you said, bipolar people commit suicide five times more than the average person. And there may be other things like eating disorders, bulimia, cutting. You know, those are things that people can really suffer terrible pain with that, emotional pain. So. That's why if you only feed that one side of the imbalance, you may make that worse. And as it gets worse, it gets to the point where, you know, I mean, the ultimate problem where they may take their own life or really hurt themselves. And on the other end of it, if you have the classic ADHD where you see, you know, you might have, again, a little bit of an attention problem and a little bit of distractibility in school, you take that out and that can become full-blown schizophrenia, that can become, you know, uh, obviously full-blown OCD and all of those things. But again, that can become really, really difficult where the person you know, has to be institutionalized or, so that's why it's important to not just, I mean, 
we're all for acceptance. We're all for not making anybody feel bad about you know any sort of disability that they have. But most people, if they have a disability, it really starts with the fact that they're unusually gifted. So we also want to celebrate their gift. But if we can, you know, also balance the system so they don't really have any great deficits and they just have gifts and then really celebrate them, that would be better because from a mental health perspective, like I said, one of the things that, you know, we know for sure is that almost all adult mental health issues really start in childhood and that the majority of them are really these right brain deficits, as Alan Shore has really described in his book, you know, with where you look at most of them are these right brain deficits that may start out as ADHD, but then if they grow, they can really become really severe mental health issues. And I think for me, one of the important components was that the left brain inattention that we're talking about, this type one inattention, is almost 20% of the population. You know, whereas ADHD is maybe 10%, maybe 10 to to 13 percent at times and and then we look at autism being only one to maybe three percent of the population but Mm -hmm. the reality is that the majority of children being diagnosed with a variety of developmental disorders are going to represent probably more likely to be that left hemispheric deficit and that one's probably going to be the one that's not clearly diagnosed very accurately right and that these children may go many many years into their childhood development before someone really recognizes this disorder that they have. Yeah, so I think for people looking at how we analyze, how do I analyze myself or my child and what does this mean for me? So what can we do? The point is you may have a diagnosis of ADHD. First of all, you should ask whoever gives you that diagnosis, is it one, two, or three? If it's two or three, it's probably more of a right brain delay and overactivity of the left. And especially if you are given a stimulant medication and it works, right? Because short term, stimulant medication does actually work. I mean, there are some many, many parents and kids that will say, yeah, when I give them the Ritalin or whatever, I mean, it's clearly a difference. But the research also shows that that only lasts for about 14 months, and then they and then it doesn't work really much anymore, right? But that also tells me, if you really give them it and it really works, and you know they also have these other gifts, like they're actually really bright, they may be really intellectual, they may be good at math, they may be really good at numbers, they may have read early, um, but they may struggle with some reading comprehension, they may struggle a little bit socially, they may not read other people really well, and they're physically hyperactive and they are impulsive and maybe really oppositional. You know, the classic ADHD, that you need to stimulate the right brain and take down the left, and there's many ways that we know how to do that, and that's important. If you're a person out there who is also labeled with ADHD and you say, is it type one, two, or three, and they say, well, it's really type one, you have to look at it, and if you're the person that is that super creative person, that's you know an artist, that's musician, that may be really driven to design, or you know maybe a really great athlete, or a dancer, or just really social and maybe hyper aware of what other people feel, and driven by anxiety because of that, and maybe you're a really slow reader, or really have been terrible at math or really can't remember details or, or don't do details, like taking a class like statistics, you want to, you know, like jump off a building or something, um, you know, and you're really not organized or your room is a total mess, um, but you're also labeled with ADHD, right, and probably maybe more have dyslexia, that's a left brain delay with overactive right, and that's a completely different model, and it's in the needs a completely different type of treatment. You need to stimulate that left brain and inhibit the right brain. And then you need to look in both of them with the bottom up stuff. You need to look for things like primitive reflexes and motor development and sensory processing. And there's things you need to do. And then with both of them, they may have problems with their digestive system and there may be inflammation in their body and all of those things nutritionally that they may need. But that's not the the sole approach. 
So you don't just need to modify your diet or take certain vitamins. There's no one vitamin for ADHD. There's no one food that they need to avoid. So it's really this relatively complex system, but we understand it and we can change it. And that's why if you're out there and you're listening to this or you're thinking about your own child, you need to understand because you don't just want to feed into that gift because that can really be dangerous long term. Well, again, I think we did a really great job explaining the differences between the right and left brain. Um, for those that want to learn more, I continue to listen to the podcast. We're going to be really covering more and more of these concepts and expanding on Dr. Malou's research. Well, I thought it was great. This is such an important topic. It's so misunderstood and so prevalent. Um, and I think if this helps people understand themselves or help their child and really understands that there are things that they can do that can really help long term um, and makes them feel better about themselves, uh, realize that they are very gifted people, but you can actually be more. Okay, so that's that's the message I think we want to bring people is always a positive message. And also, if anybody's out there and you ever listen to anybody on any podcast that says there's no such thing as ADHD, turn off the podcast and come back and listen to ours because they don't know what they're talking. Anything that comes out of their mouth after that is going to be, you know, just pure opinion that doesn't really matter. Absolutely. Well, again, great to be here today with you and um, we'll catch up soon. Okay, great.